Hello, this is Dr. Clark. This is Pharmacology, and we'll be going over systems of measurement in pharmacology. There's three different systems that we look at. The first one is the household system. This is things like pounds, ounces, miles. There's different standardization. You can look through and like uh, there's the Australian ounce and the English ounce and the American ounce or fluid ounces. And so there's a lack of standardization here. And there's also not easy conversion between things like masses, liquids, different things like that. Uh, down here at the bottom, they have what they call the apothecary system. We'll kind of talk about it also real quick. And this is a system that pharmacists used to use for uh, looking at liquids and weights. And it's kind of the basis from where the metric system came from, which is what we chiefly use. And really, the apothecary system, it says it's chiefly used by pharmacists, but not really. What most people actually use is the metric system. It was developed back in the late 1800s. A lot of it came out of France and uh, the Germany and over uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, what it is is it's actually standardizing measurements and weights. Uh, and it's pretty much been adopted around the world. They say European countries, but uh, it's also been standardized, uh, standard measurement of units in Canada, South America, Mexico, um, throughout Asia, Australia, China, uh, pretty much everywhere but the United States and a couple of countries in Africa, and maybe now Great Britain now that they're doing Brexit, that they're kind of getting tired of seeing speed limits in kilometers an hour and want to go back miles per hour. But besides a handful of countries, pretty much everybody uses the metric system. And it is used in the medical system. And we use it very heavily in the medical system is our standard way of actually measuring things, be it weight, be it length, uh, be it volume. We're going to use the metric system. And there's factors of 10. And so there's a worksheet uh, that's already in Blackboard for you that actually explains a lot of these. And uh, there's actually prefixes that actually denote the increases or the decreases in size of a unit. So you have your base units. Uh, things like meters for length, grams for weight, liters for volume. Uh, and then, you know, if you have a tenth of a liter, it's a deciliter. Uh, if you have a thousand liters, it's a kiloliter. If it's a thousandth of a liter, so 0 0.001 of a liter, it is a milliliter. Uh, a hundredth would be like a centiliter. So there are all these different factors of the base units. And these prefixes denote which is which. So when we look at the household system, it's been around the longest, uh, and it a lot of what we're using today actually probably came from the Netherlands, um, a, a little bit from Europe, and then most of it's from the Great British system. And so they call it the household system, uh, and it's also known as the, the English system. And so we have these measurements that are approximated, and we look at things such as, you know, one pound contains... Um, 16 ounces or a fluid pound contains 16 ounces but there's a difference between a regular ounce and a fluid ounce so it's not as standardized and it's very hard to actually move back and forth uh, between things like volume and measurement or mass uh, so it lacks some of that unification and then also there's things like uh, you know a cup and a teaspoon and once again it can vary from the countries or if you look at teaspoon it can actually vary with whoever your flatware man manufacturer is. Uh, and so we're using very um, much more broad, not nearly as accurate with the household system. And it's a lot harder to convert. Apothecary system was looking for using measurements for liquids, but also for weights. And pretty much the apothecary system that's still around is the British apothecary system. And so you have things such as a liquid volume, uh, of a drop of water is a mem, and that's the gold standard for a, a dropper. So uh, 60 mems equals one fluid dram. And so you're like, well, what uh, exactly defines a dram? Well, eight drams, uh, which is the equivalent of 480 grains, which is the basic weight of something. And that's actually, a grain is actually based off of the average weight of a, a grain of wheat. Um, but eight drams ends up being the equivalent of uh, one ounce, uh, fluid ounce. And so uh, when you start looking at something like a mem, uh, you find out that a mem, 60 mems is equal to a fluid dram. And so you can see 
where this gets fairly confusing because you know it's not a very smooth and easy system to figure out the weights back and forth and so there's a little bit of this still used when I first started practicing we had dry drams uh, that they used to put trihist in and it was so many drams and that's because when they first came up with this medication um, drams were still used back in the 60s and uh, they finally updated it to where we were actually giving um, a scoop with milligrams but I remember when it first started off drams it had the same thing for aspirin but most everything's gone over into milliliters or uh, over into grams or some type of different measurement system and pretty much we don't really see the apothecary being used anymore and even said the pharmacists uh, have gotten away in favor of the metric system so the metric system is a much easier way instead of having to do all these crazy conversions of uh, you know looking at the apothecary system and saying oh well uh, a grain is um, it takes 60 grains to make a dram and it takes um, eight drams would be the equivalent of an ounce. It's a much smoother system to go back and forth with. And our base things that we look at in medicine are going to be length, which is the meter, uh, volume, which is the liter, and weight, which is the gram. And our prefixes are common ones are going to be micro, which is a millionth of a unit, um, or milli, which is a thousandth uh, of a unit, centi, which is a hundredth, and kilo which is 1000 and it's very easy to do your math back and forth between these because you're you're going on factors of 10 100 or 1000 so converting within systems you know you can convert one unit to the others there's conversion factors uh, it's actually a lot uh, harder to convert within um, your when you're looking at the apothecary system or the household system but the metric it's very easy and so there's a very simple principle here if you're going from a larger unit to a smaller unit so uh, if you're going from uh, something like uh, liters to milliliters you multiply so you would multiply the amount in liters by a thousand and you get the amount in milliliters if you're converting from a smaller unit to a larger unit so if you want to go from a thousand milliliters to a liter you divide by a thousand and you would get one liter some of the other systems you have to have equations to go from like ounces to pounds so you know in a dry ounce there's 16 ounces in a dry pound there's 16 fluid ounces in a uh, fluid a uh, pound and these can actually be different so a fluid pound might not actually be the same weight as a dry pound but you know it's a much crazier system because the numbers are not standardized like in the metric system so the metric you know we have you know figuring out what our unit is knowing the uh, equivalent conversion factors and then it's very easy to change between the units because we're looking at once again you know the base unit is it a gram are we looking in a thousandth of a gram like a milligram or a hundredth like a centigram uh, or a thousand grams like a kilogram and so uh, it's a very easy way to actually sit there and move back and forth within the metric system uh, and so they're talking about moving how many decimal points so if you're moving some examples right here are if you're going from kilograms to grams you can move uh, your decimal point three places to the right if you're going from grams to kilograms you go three decimal places to the left uh, and so that's a different way instead of adding and, and dividing by a thousand or dividing and multiplying by a thousand you can just move those decimal places so this is kind of a shortcut uh, and we'll look at some of this in lab on what we can do and so right here it's always you know if you're going from uh, larger units to smaller units the quantity quantity is going to get larger so if you're going from uh, grams to milligrams um, one gram which is the larger unit is going to be the equivalent of a thousand milligrams and when you're going from smaller units to larger units, it's going to get smaller. So a thousand milligrams is the equivalent of one gram. So a thousand milligrams is a smaller unit, one gram is a larger unit. Within the apothecary system, you have to sit there and there's actually specific conversion calculations. Uh, and they actually have some of them listed in the book. And we're not going to actually go into some of these, but just know that they're they're there uh, and there's different e equations and stuff that you can use but you have to know what those conversion factors are and so when you work the problems in the back of the book you can go back to those conversion factors but they're kind of hard to sit there and actually uh, work through but um, it's just simple math and writing through your equation same thing with the household you have to figure out what your conversion factors are uh, you know, so there's, you know, things like you have to know that you have two pints and a quarts and four quarts and a gallon. 
type of things. And so you have to actually look, and they have some of that in the book that you can actually go through and, and practice on. Sometimes it's good to actually keep conversions between metric and household since we do everything in metric. People might ask you what the, the conversion to that is. Uh, when you go over to something like you tell the, the animal that uh, the owner of the animal that you've given so many liters of fluids and they might ask, well, how many gallons is that going to be? So uh, if you gave something like a liter of fluid, they're like, well, how many gallons is that? You'd say, well, the equivalent to it is it's about a quart. A liter is close to a quart. A liter is 0.95 um, of a quart. So it's nearly a one to one. So uh, or a quarter of a gallon. Uh, or you can say like a liter Coke bottle. So, uh, but that's a more common thing we'll do. And so a lot of times it's e good to have a chart available, but we don't really uh, that often actually use the conversion between metric and household ourselves. And we kind of go over this a little bit here. The slide is, is to set it up, but you have to have a conversion and they actually have some conversions uh, already listed in the book as far as converting between um, one system and the other system. On page 148, there's actually table 66, and it actually goes over things like uh, there's 1.09 yards in a meter, uh, and that uh, one centimeter is the equivalent of 0 0.39370 inches, and that one inch is 2.54 centimeters. Uh, and that a kilometer is 0 0.62137 miles. So a lot of times you have to know what these conversion factors are. And using this table in the book can actually help you convert between the two. And there's times we have to do that. Somebody might tell you, uh, well, how much did the dog vomit? Well, it, it looked like it was a pint. Uh, so by knowing that, uh, that if it looked like a pint to them, you could sit there and say, well, okay, I know that it's two pints in a quart. So that would be roughly a half a liter or 500 milliliters uh, that, that the animal has vomited up. Conversion between metric and apothecary. Once again, you're going to have to sit there and have on 6.6, it's actually going to have the conversions of what a mem is or a fluid dram, how many milliliters it is. Um, and so you actually have to have those conversion factors right there to bridge in between the two. And then it's just working through your simple math equations. Something that we actually find ourselves doing quite a bit of is actually now converting from Fahrenheit to Celsius. And the reason for this is in most of our journals that we get today, temperature is going to be listed in Celsius. If you go look at the AVMA journal or uh, at the NAVTA journal or at some of the veterinary journals like the Equine Veterinary Education Journal or the Compendium of Continuing Education, uh, all these different journals are actually going to sit there and have temperatures listed in Celsius. And that's because a lot of these things end up becoming international now. And so we're trying to get more to that international standard. If you see Fahrenheit, it's going to be in a parentheses. But temperature is going to be in Celsius. So if you're reading a, an article, you need to know how to convert temperature to Celsius. You might work at a clinic that might do this. Or if you go work at some place at A&M, they convert all the temperatures in Fahrenheit over to Celsius. And so to understand this, Fahrenheit is burst based off of mercury. It's a much older system. Uh, and it's developed over in, in Europe, probably, I'm guessing, 14 or 1500s. And so water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And so Fahrenheit is based on the measurement of mercury at different temperatures. And so when you get mercury to move to a certain slot when it gets to 32 degrees, that's where water happens to freeze at. And then water boils at 212 degrees of mercury. And so this is the whole system is you're not using water to determine the temperature. They were using mercury. In the uh, 1800s, when we did started doing work on the metric system, uh, there was a scientist named Celsius, and he came up with a new system that said, look, I'm going to base it off of water. So water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, and it boils at 100 degrees. And it's really funny if you watch TV from other countries. Like I watched a weather thing from Australia, and they talked about uh, what a hot day it was. It was uh, 38 degrees outside, and you're like, well, that sounds like a cold wave to me. Uh, but what it actually ended up being uh, is on the calculations here below, if you do it, is that the temperature they were talking about was it was 100 degrees outside when he said it was 38 degrees. But he was talking about in Celsius. 
one of the things you do is is there's a factor in here of 32. We're either going to minus 32 or add 32 to convert between the two. And then there's, if you take out 32 degrees, there's 180 degrees difference between Celsius and Fahrenheit. So Celsius is on the 0 to 100 scale between water freezing and boiling. Fahrenheit ends up being on 180 degrees. So if you take away 32 from 212, you come up with 180. So that means, uh, and Celsius is at 100. So 180 divided by 100 means there's a 1.8 degree factor. So for every degree in Celsius, that is the equivalent of 1.8 degrees in Fahrenheit. So if we're needing to convert to Celsius, we take Fahrenheit. So if you get a temperature of an animal of 103 degrees, real quick, if you grab a calculator, and I will pause here slightly for you to grab a calculator or your phone, uh, and uh, we'll go through the calculations here real quick. So hopefully you have a calculator or phone. If not, come back. Uh, stop it and pause it and then start it when you do. So we're going to take 103 degrees in Fahrenheit. We're going to minus that by 32 and that gives us 71 and we're going to divide that by 1.8 and the temperature in Celsius would be 39.4 degrees Celsius. If you're reading a journal and it said that the horse had a body temperature of 37.4 5 degrees Celsius, uh, and you want to find out how much that is in Fahrenheit, then you're going to take this equation right here. So the first one we did was up here where we took the 103 minus 32, came up with 71 divided by 1.8, was 39.4. So that's what we came out with. This answer right here was 39.4. So we're going to say that we read an article and somebody from uh, New Zealand has written it about a horse. And they say that the horse's body temperature had a temperature of 37.5 degrees Celsius. Well, you want to know what that is. You're going to take um, 37.5. You're going to multiply it times 1.8. That should give you 67.5 plus 32 means that the horse had a body temperature of 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit. So these are the formulations that you need to, to know right down someplace to be able to convert back and forth. Uh, between Fahrenheit and Celsius. Dose calculations, there's some things when we start looking at dosages that we need to know, and we'll go over these a lot more in lab. But um, we have to make sure we have the correct amount of drug to administer to the patient, uh, that we're in the right system of measurement, that we're in the metric system, uh, and then what our conversion factor is if we're not. So if we have a weight in pounds, we need to know that 2.2 pounds is equal to a kilogram. And so what we need to do is if the dose is in milligrams per kilogram and I have a 22 pound dog, I divide 22 by 2.2 and uh, I should end up with a 10 kilogram dog. And so if the dose is one mg per kg, uh, one milligram per kilogram, I take one kilogram and multiply that times one milligram per kilogram and I come out with one milligram is the dose. And so these dose calculations can be in micrograms, milligrams, grams, potentially grains, um, milliliters, liters, uh, and units. Uh, most common are milligrams, micrograms, don't really, or grams, don't really see grains anymore. We'll find milliliters and liters, and then uh, units. Units is a measurement system uh, where we're actually looking something similar to milligrams, but a little bit different as far as how we get to it. And there's certain drugs like hormones or a lot of our biological agents that we actually measure in units instead of milligrams. It's important to know that what we're actually going to be doing it in. So if we're, we're doing the measurement up here and say milligrams or in units, it's important to know is are we looking at tablets? Or are we looking at per milliliter in liquid? Uh, or are we looking at capsule? And some of these things can be divided and some of them cannot. Uh, so if we have something like a gel cap or a lot of things in capsules, we cannot. If we have a tablet, uh, we can easily divide that, and of course, milliliters and liters we can draw up into liquid and give it, you know, by the, the amount that needs to be given. Solutions are mixtures of substances that do not combine chemically with each other, uh, and so we have uh, what we call the solvent uh, and the solute. So the solvent is the dissolving part, and we have the solute, which is what's going to be dissolved in. And so actually when you look at them, uh, they don't become one when we say they're not chemically combined. If you um, put salt in water, then you end up with saline, and that's chemically combined. You actually have 
the salt dividing in there and you actually end up with we call it a saline solution but it actually dissolves ionically um, and um, and kind of disperses itself when we look at solutions uh, you don't exactly get that uh, same breakdown as you would like in salt and water uh, and when we look at them some solutions you'll actually have disbursement evenly throughout and so we call these are miscible ones where the the substance that forms the solution actually divide their particles evenly across the uh, solute or the solvent so the solute actually disperses equally across the solvent and then immiscible they actually don't they separate that's like oil and water so um, the solvent uh, and the solute don't actually evenly go together and you can uh, see a lot of these drugs that are actually in this immiscible form and uh, what we have to do is shake well we actually if you shake them then you actually make them remix and you have to use and draw up that drug and use it right then because if you give it a few minutes it'll settle back out and become immiscible again and it'll separate back into oil and water so miscible uh, you have the solute dissolves evenly across the solvent uh, and spreads or diffuses evenly across and immiscible solutions they don't actually mix and you have to forcibly make a mix when you forcibly make a mix by shaking them you need to draw them up at that time and administer them as soon as you you draw them up or as close as you can to that because in a few minutes they're actually going to sit there and start to separate themselves back out when we work with solutions it's important to know uh, the concentration so how much of that uh, solute is in that solvent and so we're usually looking at things like how many milligrams per milliliter or it could be in a tablet how many milligrams are in the tablet which is really not a solution but we're looking at how many milligrams are in something so a lot of times it's how many milligrams are in a milliliter is the way that we look at it we'll actually get in more into percentages they talk about it in here working with percentages but we'll actually get into this more in lab and work on it it's a little bit hard to explain and I'll actually do it here towards the end that we'll go over percentages and an easy way to convert these back and forth um, the books a little bit harder to try to follow it's trying to do it longhand but I will teach you a shorthand on that and the same thing with percent concentrations and how we actually prepare these from stock solutions and how we actually end up uh, coming up with these and how we actually get right here so one thing is is uh, when you're looking at determining uh, how to actually do stock solutions and get to a final concentration what we have to know is the final concentration what we have in the beginning and then I'll show you the math on actually how to work your way back from there so drug concentrations and percents we'll kind of go over this but there's a lot of different drugs that we actually use in percentages and so it's important to understand that you'll get things like 2% lidocaine or 1% lidocaine and what this actually means and so when we're looking at it uh, a percent drug like a two percent drug means uh, that there's 20 uh, milligrams in a milliliter so a one percent drug means that there's 10 milligrams in one milliliter a 0.1 percent drug means there's one milligram per milliliter and that's our basic calculation that we're coming off of one thing that we look at is reconstituting a lot of times if we have a powder form of drug and we actually go to reconstitute it uh, we have to understand that once we reconstitute it back from a dry form into a liquid form it's only going to be stable for a very short amount of time and so it's very important that we use that drug as soon as we reconstitute it if we sit there and we wait too long then the drug is actually going to go into a form that it's going to deteriorate in and it's no longer going to be useful or effective to us uh, a lot of times when we do actually um, move and reconstitute a drug there's going to be uh, periods like on larger bottles like a drug like Naxel that we reconstitute it's probably going to be good and stable for two weeks in the refrigerator a lot of these that we reconstitute if you have them up on a shelf it's usually 24 to 48 hours things like vaccines and I know there's a lot of practices they want to draw up their vaccines for the week and put them in the fridge don't do that uh, you can they're usually stable for a couple of hours after you reconstitute something like your parvovirus or your feluke um, but after uh, say six hours that they actually start breaking down there's a reason why they're in dry and liquid so if you know you have a bunch of vaccinations coming in that morning you can do that 
but you don't need to overdo it or have any extra left over because then by the next day they're already losing their strength and potency. Um, so we'll come over here and kind of go over somewhat of percentages. So the the basis of percentage is uh, this uh, equation right here that 10 grams in one liter of solution uh, is the equivalent of 1%. So to break it down easier, we're looking at 10 milligrams in one milliliter is equal to 1%. So this is the basis of percent. And sorry, I hit something right there. I hit my shift key when I was going to one. So it's exclamation part percent, but no, it's 1%. So when we talk about a solution, this is a 1%. So real quick here, if we're wanting to look at it, uh, if I have something like a 5% solution, so 5% is going to be the equivalent of 50 milligrams in one milliliter. We have stuff like uh, what we call 50% dextrose. So 50% dextrose has the equivalent of 500 milligrams per milliliter. So there's a way to cheat about percentages here. So if I had something like 50%, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit there and take the 50. I'm going to drop off the percent and just leave it as 50. My next step is going to be I'm going to move the decimal place one spot to the right and I'm going to make that 500. And so when I get to 500, after I get to 500, I'm going to put milligrams per milliliter behind it. This is the way to go if I tell you a 50% solution and ask you how many milligrams per mil it is. This is the quick way of doing it. The book wants to show you a long hand, but the short hand is, you can see right here, if I take 50%, drop the percentage off, add a zero behind it, I now have 50 milligrams per milliliter. If I told you, and I wanted to know percent, that I had something that was, uh, say, 25 milligrams per milliliter, and I want to convert to a percent, then what you want to do is drop off the milligrams per milliliter. You're going to get a 25. You're going to now take and move your decimal point one place over here to the left, make that 2.5, and then add a percent, so 2.5 percent. That's the easy way of doing it. So you take, if you want to go from milligrams to percent, um, then all you do is you say, okay, 25 milligrams per milliliter, drop off milligrams per milliliter, move my decimal place one point to the left, so take the 25, put a, a decimal place right behind that first number. So say this was 125, you would just put it between the five and the two. So you just move it over between um, that first number uh, to your right, I mean to your left, and the second number to your left right here, you just put it right there. And then you put a percent behind it, so that's a 2.5% solution. Sometimes we're actually asked to actually make these solutions. So one of the things you have to do, and they were trying to show in that one calculation there, um, where they have, uh, you know, VS and DS, VD and CD, uh, or I guess it's VC, uh, VS and CS equals to VD times CD. So what they're really looking for is, uh, if I tell you that I need 5% um, uh, saline solution and I need a liter of it, what I need to know is I just told you right there what I need. I need 5% in one liter. So this is the end product.
So this has to be known. So this is a known. So this is your first step. You have to know what this is. So if you're trying to make something, and this is what they're talking about with percentages, if I tell you I need 5% uh, in a one liter of, um, we're going to go with lactated ringer solution, and we're going to say 5% dextrose, we're going to make our own because we have a patient that's uh, not eating or uh, maybe a neonate and we're needing to boost their amount of glucose in their bloodstream, we do it through dextrose. Um, you know, this right here is my endpoint, and I have to know this. I also have to know my starting point. So my starting point is going to be, I'm going to tell you that I have 50% dextrose, otherwise known as D50. And this is going to be in solution. And one liter of LRS. Actually, let me correct the LRS up here. So what I have to find out is, really quick, to do this math, is my equation is going to be finding out my percentages, so 50% um, dextrose is going to be the equivalent of 500 milligrams per milliliter, and 5% dextrose, my end product, yep, is going to be equal to 50 milligrams per milliliter. So now I have everything in milligrams per milliliter and out of percent. So what I'm going to do is actually kind of work my way backwards. And I'm going to say that I know that if I have 50 mg per mil, so this is my end, so my end concentration, going to be 50 mg per milliliter. I'm going to multiply that times 1,000 milliliters. And that's going to end up with 50,000 milligrams. So I know I need to put 50,000 milligrams to make this solution right here. Remember when you multiply this right here on milliliters is assumed to be over 1. So what happens is my milliliters ca cancel out and I'm left with, I need my G there, with milligrams. And so I know that my end concentration in my end amount right here is going to be 50 milligrams per milliliter times 1,000 milliliters gives me 50 milligrams or 50,000 milligrams need it for solution. So now the question is, so I have right here um, my end concentration and my end volume. So this is the final concentration, final volume. I found out how many milligrams I need to make this. I know what my starting is going to be. So starting volume is also going to be a thousand milliliters. So that stays the same. What I need to find out is how much do I need to get of the dextrose. So to do that, and this is starting volume of LRS. What I need to find out is starting volume of 50% dextrose. And so to do that, what I'm going to do is take 50,000 milligrams 
and divide it by 500 milligrams per milliliter. And so when I do that, so if you get your calculator, you'll find out really quick that 50,000 divided by 500 is going to be 100 milliliters. And the thing is, is by dividing, this milligrams is soon to be over one, and then we divide. Uh, we factor and cancel out the milligrams. We are left with milliliters. So what our starting volume of our D50 is going to be is 150 milliliters need it of 50% dextrose to make a 5% dextrose in one liter of LRS. One thing to know is when you actually go to mix this, when you mix it, remove 100 mils of LRS before you add the 100 mils of fifty percent dextrose and the reason why is if you just put in a hundred mils this is all based on a liter isn't it a thousand milliliters if I just add a hundred on top of that now I have eleven hundred and do I have a five percent solution no uh, actually then uh, if I actually look at it and I have fifty thousand in there uh, divided by eleven hundred uh, I end up with a uh, four point five percent solution so that can actually end up giving you problems so always remember that whenever you do these when you find out what this starting concentration uh, is and that starting volume that you need to add with the other volume to get to your end up here um, that you end up removing that so in this case we found out that we need 100 mils of 50 percent dextrose to actually make this five percent dextrose in, in a liter so remove that 100 mils of LRS before you add that 100 mils of of dextrose. And this goes for a lot of the other drugs when you're trying to make a percent. Uh, we'll go over more of this in lab, but this is just a basic introduction to it. So this concludes chapter six.